All right, you guys ready to get into the Word today? Let's pray. Father, thank you today for the opportunity, God, to sit under your Word. We thank you, God, for your Word. Forever, Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive today. And Father, like we'll learn today, Paul's prayer, God, open the eyes of our understanding. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge into your word. We bless you, Father. We thank you for it. God, I thank you that every bondage, every addiction, every stronghold is broken off of our life because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. When he said those words, it is finished, it was done. Those things are broken off of our lives because of his finished work. So we thank you, God, today. We walk in freedom. We choose to do that, God, as an act of our will. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agreed with that, say amen. 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 All right, so last week uh, we kind of got into this, this, uh, this book of Ephesians. It's a great, it's just a powerful book. Um, just, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite books because of all the truth that's in it. Of course, the Bible's full of truth, but just the, the things about how to live and, and things. In fact, the, if, you, if you broke the, the Bible or the New Testament down into two basic things, it would be number one with this is how how God redeemed us, and the second one is how the redeemed are to live. And really, that's what Ephesians, the first three chapters, it deals with that first part of, the, of God redeeming us, and then the last three, four, five, and six, deals with uh, that second one is how the redeemed are to live. It's just such great teaching for families, for husbands, wives, children, bosses, employees, all of those different things are covered there. And last week, we talked about some things uh, kind of just as an introductory to introduce you to the city of Ephesus. We talked about some things. Uh, it was a, a city that was set on the coastline, so it had a lot of commerce trade. It was a large city. It uh, had lots of, uh, I kind of compared it to a modern-day Las Vegas, lots of things, lots of activities to do for that time period. And uh, the biggest draw was the, uh, the temple of uh, Diana, uh, the princess, or the princess of uh, fertility, and they celebrated her and worshipped her through sexual orgies. So it was a real popular church, and sex outside of marriage was A-OK. So it would be, to me, it would be an extremely difficult church to go in and to start a church. Now, there's some great churches in Las Vegas. I know of a couple that I've known some people that, that went there. I think one's called International Church of Las Vegas. It's a great church, a couple thousand, maybe more than that, five, six, seven thousand. It's a big church. And um, they are... Uh, but, you know, there's lots of, lots of Christians that, you know, people that move, people that move to Las Vegas for work and different things like that. But when you're talking about, we're talking about the early church just starting up and, you know, you're going to come into Ephesus and try to start a church there. That would be, uh, that would be a difficult place, I would think, to start, to start a church. Um, and we talked about this, that Paul, uh, in Ephesians 1, he addresses, he, he says this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus. And now, if you're a real studier and, you know, you kind of get into the word and get deeper into it, you'll find that there's some people, some theologians, Bible scholars, say that in the early manuscripts uh, is omitted the church at Ephesus. So it was just a letter, and some say that it wasn't Paul that wrote it, but, you know, it's a great letter. It's got great things in it. So um, I want to encourage you to read that. Uh, sometimes we think that, you know, the early church and the church of today, uh, but God, I don't think God sees early church and late church. I think he sees one church because God doesn't have a beginning or an end. God has always been. Our peanut brains sometimes have a hard time wrapping our minds around that. But uh, I think God sees one universal church. Is that right? Yeah. So let's read. Uh, I want us to read this prayer that Paul prayed. This is the first of two prayers. The second prayer we'll read uh, a couple weeks from now. We'll read it and when we get to, over to chapter 3. And then I'm just going to read this straight through from uh, verse 15 through verse 23, kind of like we did last week. And then we want to come back and kind of dissect the, this prayer just a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of read it straight through without making comments, which will be difficult. Okay, for, for this reason, verse 15, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus, uh, the glorious Father, may give, you, may give you the spirit of wisdom. Let me just stop right there, okay? I, I know I couldn't make it all the way through. Uh, is this in, yeah, notice that this is in red, that S is in red. And this is, might not be a big deal to you, but again, in several different translations, it's a capital S, meaning uh, it would be the Holy Spirit. Uh, little, little S is, is our spirit. 
But in, like I said, several translations, in the NIV, it's a capital S. But uh, in the original Greek, it's a small s, which again, it does, does make a difference. So just, just kind of just know that. And then we get to verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your, of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable great power to us who believe. The power is the same power, the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ Jesus from the dead. That is so powerful right there. He exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him in his own right hand in heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one that is to come. Verse 22, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. I'm telling you, these verses are so powerful. Uh, let's, t- let's take some of these apart. Verse 15, uh, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Now, this is not, it's just something that kind of stood out to me. It's, it's interesting that it, how it says this here, that it really wasn't until we hear, that Paul heard of their, their faith and their love that he started praying for them. Now, I don't for a minute think if Paul had a ministry going on there and he was away, that he never thought about them. Paul prayed, I believe, for all of his churches. But I do think it's interesting that he does mention that when the, he heard of their love and their faith, that he began holding them up in prayer. And it, it makes me think of this question. Here's a question. Do you think that the attacks on your life, now, now give this some thought, do the attacks on your life come mostly, do they come mostly when you're doing something right or when you're doing something wrong? Do the attacks on your life, do they come mostly when you're doing something right or something wrong? Now, see, I think some people have a mentality, well, when I do something, when I do something wrong, God punishes me. I'm telling you this, attacks do not come from God. They don't come from God. So again, in light of that, thinking about where attacks come from, again, we do some stupid things and get ourselves into trouble. But I'm telling you, when we're doing things right, then you are more of a prime candidate for the devil to bring attacks on you when we're doing things right. So again, just, that's kind of, a, just kind of a, a, maybe an encouragement to when you know of someone that, that, that people that are walking in faith and they're, they're walking out their faith. And like uh, Renee right now, she's walking in faith. She's believing God for uh, the healing power of God to all in her body. Um, stand with her and pray for her because, you know, the enemy would want to, to cause bad reports and all these different things so that she gets discouraged and, and gets disappointed in God because, you know, disappointment brings the frustration of expectancy where you just don't expect anything from God anymore. So when you know somebody that's walking in faith, they're walking in love, it's a good thing to pray for them. Pray for your family. Pray for people that you know, people that you go to church with, people that you work with that are believers. Pray for them because they are prime, exa- they are prime candidates for an attack from the enemy. Um, so again, take that, take that as from, a play, from Paul's playbook. Uh, again, notice that, that not only did Paul pray for them, but notice what it says there again in verse 16, and I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Thanks should be a part of our everyday life. Every day we should wake up, we should be thankful to God. Lord, this is the day that you have made. I choose to rejoice and be glad. And I don't care if it's been five days of straight rain. God, this is the day that you have made. Be, we can get above the circumstances and be thankful because of the things that we're learning in this tremendous book of Ephesians. It's just a great, great example. Be thankful for that. Um, Ephesians 5.20 says this. We'll, we'll get there one day, but it says uh, one week. Uh, verse 20 says, always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you. In everything give thanks for God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, in everything, by prayer and supplication, uh, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The word supplication, it just means to plead humbly. Just to plead humbly before God. We're not to come to God. The Bible says we're to come boldly, but boldly doesn't mean arrogantly, does it? You can come boldly and still be supplicate. You can still come humbly, even though you're coming boldly before the throne of grace. God just tells us that, I believe, in the book of Hebrews, so that that we're not afraid to ask. We just feel like we're asking God for too many things. But I do think that that we ought to be, that our praying... Uh, you know, there's different types of praying. There's the prayer of consecration. Jesus prayed the, the prayer of consecration in the garden uh, when he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. 
Uh, that's the prayer of consecrating ourselves to God, and that's a, that's a prayer that we should do. Uh, there's the prayer of petition. That's where we ask God for things, and we, we, we're, we, are, we, we do, like I just said, we go before the throne of grace to, to, to ask uh, for things like that. But again, um, I remember a story that uh, Kenneth Hagin told where a woman had uh, came to him, uh, had seeking healing, and she had been to several different people, di- several different ministers that were known in the healing revival, and had them pray, and she just, just said, you know, I just can't seem to get my healing, just can't seem to get my healing, what, can you help me? He said, well, I'll do if you'll, if you'll, if you'll uh, do what I tell you to do, and she said, well, I will if it's easy, and that's a good thing to do, do it if it's easy, right? And he told her, he said, simply, he said, well, what I want you to do, he said, I want you to, to, uh, in other words, he showed her, or he said what the Lord had showed him to, to tell her was there's like the scales, you know, the scales of justice. And uh, he said, this is, your, this is your asking, this is your request, and it's way down here. It's heavy with requests and asking God, begging God to heal you, and this is your praise. This is your thanksgiving for your healing, and it's way up here. He said, when, you're, he said, when your thanksgiving and your praise equals your, your asking, he says, you'll get your healing. And it was some time later she wrote to him and says, I got my healing. And I tell you, it's so important. I think the most of our praying really should be thanksgiving for what God has done. Because everything, most of the things, most everything that we pray for is in God's word. It's been done. It's been finished. Like I said, it's done on the cross. So thank you. I mean, the fact that, you know, when I'm praying for, for healing, you know, uh, for myself or for Paula, Father, my prayer, I start off this prayer. Father, I thank you that by your stripes that she's healed. I'm just thanking God for already what's taken place. Because the Bible says by his stripes she was healed. And, the, you know, and if she was healed according to Scripture, then she still is healed. We just need to get a hold and line up with what God's Word says in our lives. Amen? I was all free. Um, so sometimes, sometimes when we listen to uh, read the Bible, sometimes you can th- jump over and think that uh, these things um, were, were Paul or were some other, one of the other writers uh, but again, we've got to remember that the Word of God is the inspired Word of God, that God moved on holy men of old to write these things down. In fact, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, all Scripture, New American Standard says, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. I love the way that the me- Message Bible says this. He said, every part of Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for one way or another, showing us the truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live uh, God's way, and through the Word we uh, we put together, we put together, we are put together, and shaped up for the task that God has for us. So all the Word of God, God's Word, God moved on holy men of old to write these things, and it's interesting because Paul will write through Paul's personality. John would write through John's personality. And so do you understand all this, again, it's, it's of God. Here's, a, here's another great illustration. Um, in 3 John 2, 3 John 2, 3 John only has one chapter. So it's verse 2. It says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects that you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. Well, is that John's will? That John's writing it? Is that John's will or is that God's will? Yes. It is, because I think John, being a man of God, he wants what God wants, and God wants us to prosper. God wants us to be in good health. Do you believe that? How many of you really believe that, that God really wants you to be in good health? Now, up to this point, up to this point, uh, what we've seen in Ephesians chapter 1. Last week, we saw in verse 3 that we've we've been blessed with all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We saw in verse 4, it's God's intent that we would live holy and blameless lives. In verse 5, we saw that we are adopted as his children. Verse 7, that Christ, all the, uh, the redemption and forgiveness. We have redemption and forgiveness through Christ. All of these things, all of these purposes of God and we, I want to read this verse again, verse 10, because it's so, it was such an important verse. That in, this, this, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that he might gather together in one thing, uh, gather together, I'm sorry, gather one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Again, that's talking about the, the saints that are in heaven, the saints that are on earth. God's going to gather all of that together. Now notice carefully what Paul prays here in verse 17. He says, I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, remember what we just read, all of those things from verse 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 
All of these things I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the the glorious Father, he may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in in his holy people, and verse 19, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. Now, if you're like me, you probably read this passage or in Ephesians, you read it many, 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 many times. And yet, again, this letter is so loaded, it's so loaded with tremendous, tremendous powerful truths. And it's more than just hearing this. Paul is wanting them to see this. He's wanting to see it with their spiritual eyes. He's wanting to get them a spirit of wisdom and revelation to understand what he's saying. The more, again, to make sure that we read, it's it's more important not just that we read it, but that we get it. That's why Paul is praying these prayers that we'll say he wanted them to see it. He wanted them to, to get it. He prays it the eyes of their heart. Notice he didn't say, he didn't say he prays that their heart will be open. What is the heart? It's not talking about our, our, our muscle and our bodies that pumps blood through our, throughout our body. It's talking about the heart is the center of man, the spirit of man. So our heart, that the eyes of our heart, the eyes of our spirit would be open to receive uh, all of these things and a spirit of wisdom to receive all of these things that God has. Remember that the us, the real us, that will live forever in eternity, one place, either in heaven or in hell. If you're born again, it's in heaven to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. But to be, for, our body, for our spirit to be here, we have to have a fleshly body. Uh, I like one person called it a, an earth suit. Uh, so we have to have an earth suit. Our spirit has to be here. When our, when our muscle, our heart muscle, quits beating and our brain quits sending signals throughout our body, our body dies, our spirit has to leave, it goes somewhere. And it's not just hanging around in this building. But it goes somewhere. It either goes to heaven. Again, those that are absent from the, uh, for believers, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. For other people, it's to go to a place called hell. There's only one or two places that we can go. So again, I am a spirit. I have a soul. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And we have a physical body. And one day, what, when you got born again, those of you that are born again, what got born again? Did your body get born again? No. Did your soul, did your mind get born again? No. The Bible, that's the reason that we're supposed to do something with the soul. We're supposed to do something with, we're supposed to do something with our mind. We'll talk more about that here in just a moment. But it says, when it says, the, open the eyes of our understanding, I believe that the eyes of our understanding, the eyes of our heart, one translation says understanding. I think that's uh, King James, and it's, uh, it's not a good translation. It should be heart. The eyes of our heart uh, is our, I believe, is our mind. The eyes of our heart is, is our heart. Does that, does that make sense to you? That's why we're told to do something with our mind. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, uh, don't be, don't be uh, what does it say? Uh, don't be uh, conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of what? Of your mind. Our mind needs to be renewed our mind needs to be renewed. That word transformed in the Greek, it's, it's translated in a, what's called a passive imperative. A passive imperative, and it means, it means keep on being transformed. Keep on being transformed, much like Paul will use the passive imperative again uh, in his translation in, in Ephesians chapter 5 when it says, be filled with the Spirit. And the only way to, to translate that in the English is to be, to be filled with the Spirit, but it actually says in the Greek, be being filled with the spirit it's a continual filling why do we have to be continually filled because we leak we leak now it's just like just like our natural bodies when uh, we don't just eat one time to, to live you got to eat and you could translate that in the passion period you got to keep on eating in order to live you just can't eat one meal and go a month you've got to eat and eat and eat and you got to be filled with the spirit you get filled with the Spirit over and over and over. Again, I didn't say, it doesn't say keep on getting saved because once you're saved and you, you're, you're in, nothing can pluck you out of the hands of God. Is that right? It is right, Pastor. Good preaching. I like that. Thank you. So again here in this, in this Romans chapter 12, Paul is implying a couple of things here that I want us to see. He's implying that it's, uh, it's very, there's a very real pressure to be conformed to the pattern of this world. I think more so now than, than, when, than when Paul wrote this. 
There's a, there's a, a pressure to be conformed to the world. And, and we have this thing today that if you're not conformed to their way of thinking, it's called cancel culture. You get canceled. They don't, they don't want to just, they, they want to, they want to, they want to cancel you. They talk about canceling. That means they want to, you to lose your job. They want you to lose your ability to feed your family because you're not coming into the pattern of the way that they think. So there's a very, very real pressure to conform to the pattern of this world. And again, people will try to squeeze you into their way of thinking. You know, there used to be in this country a thing called the you know, freedom of speech, freedom of, uh, freedom of thinking. I don't know if there's a thing, but there was, you obviously there, but you can't, you can't have thoughts of your own now. You've got to think like the world kind of wants you to think. Remember again, Satan is the God of this world, and he will use his influence in this world uh, against Jesus, and he uses it against his church. And the second thing that I see here that Paul is, I believe he's implying here, there is an alternative to conforming to the world's values and its lifestyles, and it's called transformation. Transformation is the result of when Christ and his word renew our minds so that our vision, our values, and our plans are governed by God's revelation and his truth, his eternal truth, and uh, rather than the world's temporal, the world's temporal deceptive patterns. Remember again, Paul didn't say, he didn't say, read this over and over and over until you intellectually get this. To, in other words, till you get this mentally. He was praying that the Spirit of God would give us, give them a spirit, spiritual wisdom and revelation knowledge so that we could know him better. Know him better and all of those things that, again, the back in verse 3 and verse 4 and verse 5, all those things that we've read in, in the early part of Ephesians here so that we would know those things, uh, what, what they mean. Listen, anybody can read the Bible. Anybody can read the Bible and know what it says, but it's the Holy Spirit who can reveal those truths and give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation about what God's Word is saying. That doesn't mean that God can't use someone to help you to, to understand God's Word, to read God's Word. Uh, God anoints men and women to teach the Word, to, to help illuminate us, to help us to see. But again, it's the Holy Spirit that ultimately brings revelation into our hearts. Again, the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is having a better understanding and alignment to know Christ better. That's our ultimate, ultimate goal. You know, in our, uh, in our connect group uh, that we meet every other Monday night, we're going through a course called Hearing God, and it's by John and Lisa Bevere, and he's got a couple other people on there that are teaching on it. And uh, this past week, I thought was a really good one, and John said something that I, I fully agree with, and I want to be careful how I say it because I don't, ever, I don't, I don't want to discourage you from reading a, a one-year Bible. As I said, I went through that last year. Paul and I are going through it again. And, uh, but there's a, the danger of that, doing the one-year Bible or just reading for, go, going through the Bible is, uh, is those times when you, you miss a, a day or two, you just get busy, something happens, and, you, and now you've got to catch up. And so you're cramming those three days in there. And so it's just reading the Bible. And again, I think, and John had mentioned this, and I totally agree with him, I think sometimes it's better to take a, a chapter or a passage of Scripture and dissect that and get into it and study that and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to show you things than it is to be able to say, hey, I read the Bible through in a year. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I agreed with when John said that. Again, uh, why did I write that? Okay. All right. So let's go on. Um, so again, don't leave, don't leave here today thinking that I'm, that I'm against or saying against uh, learning doctrine or learning um, uh, ed uh, education. I am all about, you know, getting education. But there's something beyond, there's something more than just knowledge. There's something no more than knowledge, and it's called understanding. It's an understanding thing which tells a person when and how and where and with whom and how to use that knowledge. Beyond understanding, there's something called wisdom. Wisdom, it tells, us, tells a person why we do certain things, why it's true and false, and what's the relevance of it, what's the relevance of that information. There's a difference between natural wisdom and spiritual wisdom. Did you know that? There's a difference between natural wisdom and spiritual wisdom. Natural wisdom, uh, it pertains to the knowledge and understanding about the physical, the fleshly, and the material world. How many of you know somebody that doesn't have a lot of what we call natural wisdom? It's called common sense. I mean, I do. I've known some people, man, they're smart, they're in, in intellect, they're, in, uh, they, you know, intellectually, they're, they're, they're very educated, but they just don't have a lot of common sense. 
You know, it don't take a whole lot of common sense to, when you see the eye of a stove on, stove on and you're feeling some heat to, to put your hand down on it. Just kind of common, basic, basic common sense. Touch it. Don't touch that, right? Same thing with an iron. When you put an iron on, it's one of that's hot yet. Common sense tells you wet your fan and put it on there quick. Again, these are just some simple tips. You might want to write some of this stuff down. But I mean, it's just, again, common sense tells you when you get to a, you come to a red light and you get to a right turn on red, you can, uh, you, you can turn over. Common sense tells you to look both ways before you go. But again, just again, common sense. Spiritual wisdom pertains to the things, the things of God, including God's overall plan and his purpose for our, our lives. I want you to notice specifically uh, three things that Paul prayed here in verse 18 and uh, in verse 19, three things that I want you to see. Number one is this, uh, verse 18 says that he prayed that, uh, that we may know the hope to which he has called, the hope to which he has called us. And again, we've already seen this word called earlier in Ephesians in chapter, uh, in verse one, he said just, uh, uh, verse four, it says, just as he has chosen you, this is the same word, it's the Greek word called kaleo. Sometimes it's translated chosen, other times it's translated called. He's called us, he's called us. And it says that we may know the hope to which he has called us. That hope is not just a a whim or a wish. This is what we call Bible hope. There's a difference between uh, sometimes a hope in our English language is like, well, gee, I hope. Like, you don't, we don't say, I hope Jesus is coming back. But we know that he is. It's our, it's our hope that one day that he's coming that Jesus is coming soon. It's not a, you know, uh, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. That's Bible hopes. Again, it's not just a whim. Gee, I, I hope it happens. I hope that I'm healed. That's, that's our English translation of, of, of hope. But again, Bible hope is I am healed because of the great hope that we have in what Jesus Christ accomplished for us on the cross. Romans 8, 23 says this. It talks about that our redemption, our bodies, our redemption of our bodies is talking about the rapture of the church. And that's when we'll all be transformed in the likeness uh, of God. Now listen to this. When we see this present life, when we see this present life in context of eternity, it'll take on a different meaning. When we see our life and our lives in context of eternity, heaven and hell, it'll take on a different meaning. Uh, Number two, the second thing Paul prays in verse 18 there, says the riches of his glorious inheritance in his saints. The glorious inheritance in his holy people, this translation. the NIV says. Again, take note that Paul, he didn't say the riches of our glorious inheritance. It's his, it's Jesus Christ's glorious inheritance. Paul is saying here that the saints are the glorious inheritance of Jesus. Man, what a, what a great value God places on us that he would see that, that Jesus would see us as his glorious inheritance. Listen to what it says in um, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So again, we were on his mind, on the cross. We are his glorious inheritance. Uh, when we understand, again, our value to the Lord, it should cause us to live our lives in a different way. When we understand our value, how valuable we are to our Heavenly Father, it should cause us to live differently. Most kids, when they recognize the value that they are to their parents, especially little boys to their dads and uh, even daughters to their dads, they recognize how valuable that they are. When a dad lets their kids know that, it causes them to react to that. They want to please their father. So we talked about three specific things that Paul prayed here in, uh, in Ephesians in 18, and now here's verse 19, here's the third one, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. The English Standard Version says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? In other words, Paul, throughout his writings, he's continually reminding us that the Holy Spirit has been given to us to empower us so that we'll preach, that we'll be able to preach the word, teach the word, uh, teach the gospel with authority, that we'll preach with conviction, that we'll we'll, uh, work miracles, again, through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, we'll overrun the works of the devil. That's what he continually, Paul is getting through to us about the importance of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. This is Paul's uh, Holy Spirit empowered prayer. And he keeps on saying this. He keeps on with this. Again, verse verse 17, going back to this, he says, I keep on asking that he, talking about the Father, that he may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. 
Listen, it's, it, it wasn't like that the, the early church had 10 different translations of the Bible, four different kinds of concordances, and Bible dictionaries to study, to study the word. There's a pretty good chance that this letter of Ephesus, whether it was written to Ephesus or not, and again, some, some Bible scholars say that the, the, to the church at Ephesus was omitted in some of the original transcripts. But whatever it was, this letter, I would almost guarantee you, was reprinted and sent to other churches in the area. There's evidence of, of letters being sent to other churches uh, in the Bible. Let me give you a couple examples. First Peter, uh, Peter obviously wrote this, uh, and he said, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered, scattered, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who were chosen. James, another uh, New Testament Bible author, James chapter 1, verse says this, James 1, 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. It would be difficult to get a letter to a dispersed group of people, to a group of people that are scattered abroad. So copies, copies had to be made. Copies had to be made of this. Uh, you may recall in John's uh, letter, in John's letter the, called the book of Revelation, um, he made this statement he said, I testify to everyone who hears these words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. Verse 19 says, and if anyone takes away from the words uh, of the book of prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in the book. So he's talking to these people who were hired as scribes to go and to copy these letters and send them on. Um, you know, I've said, I've, I've mentioned before uh, the Passion Translation, and I, when, I, when that first came out, I loved that translation. Then I heard some things that kind of disturbed me uh, about it, and I'm not trying to make a big deal out, out of it. You like the Passion, you read the Passion, that's, that's good. But uh, there was just some things that, you know, in all Bible translations, uh, when you open up to the cover, you go through the cover, uh, and look in the, in the, uh, the first few pages where it gives the, uh, who the contributors were. There's no contributors to the guy who wrote the Passion. That he got all of this from God and a visitation from he to heaven. He got a visitation uh, on this himself. And then this really, this really bothered me, is that he said that God is gonna, God later is gonna call him back to heaven and give him the 22nd chapter of John. And if you know there's only 21 chapters in John, but he's gonna give him the 22nd chapter. And I think very, that I just thought of this verse in, in, uh, in, that we just read, that if anyone adds to or takes away, that's a dangerous, dangerous place to be. So, you know, with that, uh, you know, I just, for me, I just, I kind of don't trust some of, the, uh, some of the things that are translated in that, so I don't use it that often at all. But, uh, so again, let me give you one more example to show that these letters were, were passed around to other, other places. Uh, particularly between this example is between the, the church at Colossae, which is the book of Colossians, and the book to uh, a church in Laodicea, or the, the, uh, the uh, Laodiceans. Uh, this is Paul writing to the church at Colossae, chapter 4, verse 16. He says, when this letter is read among you, have it, read, have it also read in the church at the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read the letter from the, uh, coming from the Laodicea. So again, we see that these, these things were written and passed around. Uh, I just, again, it's, it's hard to imagine um, because we have such a, a privilege of, of Bibles, a plethora of Bibles that we can have. And to understand that when the Ephesians got this letter passed down to them and carried to them, because uh, Paul wrote this from prison when he, he got it to them and sent it to them, they had someone obviously read this to them, but we have the privilege of going back and reading it and reading it and reading it and praying over it, but they heard it, and until maybe somebody, somebody copied it, it, it would have been, what, what was it till uh, the King James first edition came out? Was it 1500s? 14s? 15? Anybody know? It was like 1500s. There wasn't a, there wasn't a printed Bible until, till, you know, 1500 years after Jesus had died on the cross. So again, we are, we are blessed in this, in this country. Let me, let, me show you my, let me show you my Bibles. Thank you. This is my, these, are, these are just the Bibles in, uh, in my office.
These are not included in the Bibles at home. And this proves to you, if nothing else, I am quite the theologian. That's just, oh, oh, one more. That's just, that's just the Bibles that, that I have. And I've gotten, I've gotten some old, old Bibles that uh, uh, it was somebody else's. I mean, and, and I've, and when we were moving, you know, we're, we're turning that, and I took it and I, and I, and I threw it away and it was old and tattered and I threw it away. Mm, I can't do that. I just can't throw a Bible away. So, but these are all good Bibles. If you need a Bible, I can tell you where you can get them. <laughs> but great Bibles. But, you know, there's a, there's a video that uh, I've showed this before, but if you haven't seen it, it's, uh, it's, about a, it's just a minute long. It, the quality of it is really poor, and I've heard that the quality of it was done on purpose because it's, it was in China. I want you to watch these, these Chinese students receiving their first Bible and watch this. great exhortation read your Bibles I can't watch that without tearing up and thinking how blessed that we are how blessed that we are and how many times how many Christians today in our country never read their Bible don't ever well I'll say don't ever but so seldom maybe on Sunday maybe when they come to church they open up a Bible app or or something but we should we should love and appreciate the Word of God cherish the Word of God be thankful for the Word of God thankful father today we do we thank you for your word oh God we thank you for your word God Lord open the eyes of our understanding open the eyes of our understanding God give us that spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge God to understand your word Lord forever Lord we choose as an act of our will to hide your word into our hearts that we may not sin against you God we realize that it's because it's in our heart God that we can keep our lives pure and walk in your word we bless you and we honor you today. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for your word. God, thank you for the freedom that we have in this nation. God, to read your word. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.